Good evening and welcome to Grace Baptist Church here at our Sunday night service. We're glad that you're here. Let's all stand together as we sing Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. Amen. We'll look forward to the service today. Let's give the, give the service to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and its work. Lord, we thank you that though the stain was dark, uh, your grace availed by the blood of Christ to wash it away. Lord, uh, each time we meet, we earnestly desire that you would mark this service, Lord, with your power and presence. We ask that you would accomplish what only you can accomplish, that you would save the lost and revive the saved, that each of us would leave closer to you than uh, the way we came. And Lord, so we commit ourselves in the service to you for that end. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Let's continue singing with our new song, Christ is Enough. Rise up. 
All right, just a couple of things from the bulletin then here tonight. Um, there is a teen hangout immediately after the service tonight. I think there's a bus out front, right? Is there a bus out front? Or? There is. There's a bus. All right, so teens, right after the service, get to the bus, and uh, they'll take you where you're going here tonight. Ladies of Grace, don't forget that tomorrow night at 6.30 in the Fellowship Hall is every Chicks' birthday bash. And uh, we're going to hold that tomorrow, it looks like. So all the ladies are invited. Bring somebody that you can invite uh, to come with you, somebody that doesn't normally come to church or to the Chicks' mixes. All right, and I hope that you'll have a great time there. I know you will, so get to know some people. It's a great opportunity to um, uh, utilize that to uh, get deeper into the church and to know some folks that you didn't know before. Of course, we've got the discipleship studies on Tuesday. Wednesday, we have our uh, midweek prayer and Bible study, as well as all of our children's programs and our grief share program meeting in the elementary library down the hall. There's a college hangout at the Gunther's home and Reformers Unanimous meeting on Friday, every Friday at 7 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. A lot of people have asked me about the baptism class next Sunday night at 5 o'clock before the evening service. And if you are interested in being baptized, I have a host of people right now that are interested in that, and that is really great, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, the meeting is in the office area right back here in the conference room. Um, I'll be there. I'll direct you in things, and we'll just have an informal time of explaining baptism, making sure everybody's questions are answered, and then planning for next um, Sunday, the first Sunday in February, is when we're going to be doing that. And so if you are interested in being baptized, this would be a great opportunity uh, to get in um, on the first baptism of the year. And so if you have any questions, please see me or one of the staff, and they'll point you in the right direction on that. Uh, we will have our last um, elective class. Our last elective class is coming Wednesday. Um, and then we'll start new ones on Wednesday, February 3rd. You can see those there in the bulletin. And then mark on your calendar, as I said this morning, March 6th is a family bowling night. We'll be giving you more information as that date draws near, but I hope you'll plan on coming to that and bringing somebody with you as well. We were praying uh, this morning for Leslie Whistler. She's back here. She's got that knee surgery tomorrow. All right, and so continue to pray for Leslie, if you would, please, um, on uh, that surgery. And, of course, the, the, the surgery is fine. The rehab is what's going to get her. <laughs> so not to encourage her anything here tonight, but, you know. So uh, I think um, she's had enough of the pain that she's been in. She's ready to go through this. All right. We're going to have our men come at this time to receive the evening offering. We have the heartstrings playing for us tonight here as well, so that's a special treat. Um, if you want to get involved with them, um, they take all comers, all right? They take all comers, all different begin, uh, levels of, uh, from beginners to uh, experts, all right? So don't, don't feel bad about where you're at in your training. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to um, receive this offering tonight, Lord. Uh, we know, Father, that you are um, entrusting us with funds uh, that you have given to us so that we can then in turn invest it into your work. And so, Father, I pray that for us here in the auditorium, for those watching online, that we would be mindful of that, Lord, that um, we um, have been given things by you that you need from us as far as giving it back, making sure that our heart is with the ministry, with your work, um, and with your will. In this way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you, Heartstrings. Sweet hour of prayer. The last stanza of that song says, This robe of flesh I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. How sweet will it be when we don't have to pray? We get to walk right up to Christ and see him face to face one day. It's an exciting truth and one of those things that we can learn from hymns as we sing tonight. Let's all stand as we sing, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Stanza will dismiss the four to eight year olds to their class on the last. be seated. At this time, we'll have a special in song by Sandy Seco. Seek to lure us straight. 
storms obscure the light of day, but in Christ I can be bold. I've an anchor that will hold, and it holds my anchor holds. Blow your wildest that old gale on my ship so small and Thank you, Miss Siegel. If you have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn to Psalm chapter 46, Psalm chapter 46. I entitled my message tonight, God is our refuge. God is our refuge. I believe that through the events that's happened this past year, that has revealed what has been going on in the hearts of many people. According to Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, out of the heart comes the thoughts we have, the words we say, and the actions that we do. People have been so focused on their, their attention on the events that's going on around them, for example, COVID-19, the, pol the political scene, the economy, and possibly even some personal trials that they are going through, that it has caused many to begin to worry, to fear, to have anxiety, to be depressed, and even to have suicidal thoughts. And this isn't only for adults. We see this also happening with children. Many blogs that I uh, read, that's uh, biblical counseling blogs, and as well as emails that I get from different resources, have said that they've seen an increase in these areas as far as counseling not only in the, in the biblical realm, but also even in the secular world, some of the articles I have read. I believe that uh, people are finding out that they might not really know how to handle situations, tough situations when they come. So many Christians, I believe, has turned their eyes off of God and began to look at just the circumstances that's going on around them. Even some may wonder, where is God? If this is happening, where is God? This passage that we'll be looking at tonight, Psalms 46, is a psalm that uh, led Martin Luther to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. The psalm that we just sung just a few minutes ago. Tonight, we're going to be reminded how God is ready and willing to help us even when things seem to be out of control. Let's begin by reading in Psalm 46. Psalm 46, verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountain be carried into the midst of the sea, thou, uh, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with a swelling thereof, First thing I see in this passage is that the almighty protection of God. The almighty protection of God. In verse 1, we see that God is our refuge. Refuge means a place of protection. A place that we can feel secure. And the, the expression, God is our refuge, is often shifted to a verb phrase, which could mean God is the one who protects us. Or God is the one who shelters us. I remember a time when my older brother had a newspaper route. Later, I took that newspaper route over. But at this time, I was younger in elementary school. And he asked me one day to, to go with him to make it go quicker. And he would give me a little bit of money. I don't even remember how much. But uh, I agreed. And so as he was delivering some sections, I would go ahead and deliver it another area. And he asked me to go down a couple blocks away down from him to be able to deliver these papers. And the only concern I had is that there's a couple guys, Jack and Scott, who were bullies to me. And uh, it's interesting because later in life now, you know, we're growing, we're, we've uh, talked many times, everything's great. But at that moment, 
I didn't want anything to do with him. So I told Jeff, you know, my concern. And he said, just give me the signal. There was a certain whistle. It wasn't really a whistle. It came from the throat. Since my voice changed, I can't do it anymore. But, uh, but anyway, it was, be, it was able to be heard. I'm not making this up. Two to three blocks away. So was Jeff able to do it. So was David. And we knew it. He said, if they come, they give you a problem, just give me that whistle. I'm like, okay. So I end up going and heading down, delivered a paper, came back to my bicycle, I got ready, and who do you think was waiting for me? Scott and Jack. And as I was standing there, and they were hanging on the handlebars, and they were giving me some problems and everything, and I gave the signal. And at that time, Jeff was in uh, junior high football, and he was about a block and a half away. They're standing here. He's coming from that direction. They have no idea he's coming. And all I did is started smiling. Of course, they're like, what are you smiling at? You know, and all this stuff. And uh, next thing they knew, they were on the ground looking up at my brother saying, don't you ever mess with Rodney again or you're going to be messing with me. To my remembrance, I don't think they ever messed with me again. He protected me. He's just my brother. I don't mean that in a disrespectful way, but he's just my brother. He's just, he's just human. He's sinful. We have a righteous, justice, a justified God that is going to protect us. He knows what we need. He knows who has wronged us. And he's going to be there. But God is not only our refuge. Next we see in that verse 1 that, he strength, uh, that God is our strength. That God is our strength. Strength means power, able to defend. Can you think of a better person that's able to defend over God? I can't. When we feel weak, unable to go on, we need to remember that we don't need to face life in our own strength. We can rely on God to help us. 2 Corinthians 12, 19, or 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my affirmity that the power of Christ may quest, or rest upon me. When we're weak, things seem to be out of control. We feel like, we, we feel just totally out of control, like nothing's there for us. How can we get the help? God's there. And God's grace is going to be there to help us. It's sufficient. We can learn on, or we can lean on God's strength in our weaknesses. But you know what? It still gets better. It still gets better. But God is not only our refuge, not only our strength, but at the end of that verse, it tells us that God is present and helps us through our trouble. We're not walking through life on our own. The word very present translates, uh, translates a phrase meaning very accessible. Very accessible. We have access to God's throne room. Amen. Matter of fact, he tells us that we're supposed to come to his throne room boldly. Now, I remember, and I, I used this illustration once before, um, but when we, a couple of years ago, went on a senior trip, we had the great privilege as we went through uh, the White House, well, the Eisenhower building, which is where all the, uh, most, of, most of not all the offices for the vice president's uh, staff is, and we were able to come down the steps, and basically from where I'm at to probably where Connie and Dave Cochran are sitting, was the entrance to, uh, well, maybe a little further back, but that's the sidewalk where you'd walk up to go into the West Wing. And Mike Pence was coming in. We were able to um, go and shake hands. He came over and talked to the seniors for about 15 minutes. It was awesome. How close do you think I would have gotten to the door to walk into that West Wing? Oh, I just want to talk to President Trump. I just want to go in, you know, chat. You know, I'm here on the premise. I, I just want to give him some of my thoughts. Well, I'll tell you, as Mike Pence, Pre uh, Vice President Mike Pence was starting to, uh, was seeing us, and we were starting to walk down that sidewalk, there was a Secret Service agent that, got, that told me to stop. I stopped. <laughs> and then he looked behind him, 
saw the vice president was a little different, stepped over a couple steps to be between me and the vice president in ready position. And I tell, uh, if he, like I said last time, if he said jump, I would have said hi, hi, because that pavement did not look very soft. He was ready. We have no way of just going up and saying, hello, president, I want to talk to you now. But yet, we have the privilege and been told to come boldly to the creator of this world and bring our, these, our, our needs and bring our requests to him. Do you realize the privilege that we have? You know, the verb tense here means be present or near. And as soon as I had read that in, my, in the commentary, it's a verse that always has come back to me. It's a verse I learned as a teenager. was Hebrews 13, 5, the end of it. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. No matter what the circumstances, no matter if you're worried about COVID, no matter if you're just blowing your mind by how on earth did this election happen the way it happened. No matter if you're having a personal, personal uh, trial going on in your life, you're not going through it alone. God is right there with you. God is able to be everywhere at once without limitations. Now don't try to figure that out. Our finite minds will not be able to understand that. But God is everywhere at one time. And then we see in verse 2, the first word, therefore. When you see the word therefore, it is a word that calls for reflection on what has just been said. So in other words, because God is our refuge, because God is our strength, because God is present with us during trouble, we are called not to fear, not to worry, not to fret about things that are going on. Though the earth moves, though the mountains falls, though the sea roars, though the mountain quakes, we are not to fear. All these catastrophes uh, listed in verses 2 and 3 represents the end of the world or a disappearance of order and, and a return of chaos. Yet God is in control. He tells us not to fear. Let me make it a little bit more current. Though COVID-19 rages, though the politics changes, though the economy fluctuates, Though I face personal issues, personal trials, I will not fear. Why? Why? Because God is in control. Say that with me. God is in control. Say it one more time, but louder. God is in control. Are those just words that you're repeating? Or do you truly believe that? God is in control. God has not left his throne. When you're sick, when uncertain, uh, uncertainties come, even when death comes, we are to know that God's in control and we don't need to fear. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear here. I'm not talking about a blind faith. I'm talking about a certain faith. My hope and my trust has, uh, in God who has never failed me. Oh, he may have brought circumstances in my life, and he has in my life, that I don't understand. I may even wonder why, God. But he has never failed me. He has never failed me. So therefore, we can trust him. Well, even if, actually, even if we don't understand that, we should trust him. Because God is in control. Faith is when we fix ourselves on God. We are focused on the one who has perfect love. And you probably all know this verse. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath tor uh, torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Fear does not come from God. Secondly, what I see in this passage from verses 4 through 7 is the unfailing presence of God. The un, 
uh, the unfailing presence of God. Let's pick up our reading in verse 4, Psalms 46. There is a river, the stream thereof, or whereof shall make glad the city of God. This is referring to Jerusalem. The holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right error early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Verse I see in verse 4, God satisfies his people. God has provided a stream of sufficient um, provision for their water in Jerusalem. The inhabitants were satisfied. The inhabitants was pleased with God's provision for them. That is in verse 4. And secondly, in verse 5 and 6, I see God's strain, uh, uh, God sustained his people. The city uh, stand firm under the protection of God. Remember, at the beginning of verse 5, God is in the midst of her. God is there, his presence. Where's God's presence right now? It's living within us. He is with us. Even in the face of certain attacks, where it says the heathen raged, God's voice is capable of defeating any army, any enemy. When it comes to safety, God sustained his people where they are. In verse 7, I, I see God saved his people. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts is something render, uh, sometimes rendered Lord of the armies. And since the focus is upon the power of the Lord, the titles also may be rendered the Lord um, is the strongest all, of all, the Lord who is all powerful, the Lord who has all strength. Do you grasp who God is? He is more powerful than anyone we ever knew. Any army that we ever have here in this world. He can speak the word and they're gone. God protects us. We can get worked up. I've, I, I've uh, looked not only from the reports that I, I said earlier from blogs and stuff, but also looking at Facebook talking to people, the fears, anger, the anxiety and everything that's going on in people's lives and everything. God was in control and, and nothing's going to happen but not in God's plan. We're right now living in a, if you know the old movie projectors with the reels, I know I'm, I'm, I'm uh, dating myself now, but uh, we're looking at one frame. God sees the whole movie, the whole reel. Say, well, how on earth can God use what's going on right now? Well, I'm not God, but a few thoughts came to my mind. One, maybe he's trying to get the church to turn back to him, to be able to totally re trust and rely on him. Maybe he's trying to get Christians to fall down on their knees to pray. I do know that uh, it does say that he, uh, the heathens will be glorified. I think that's in my next point. I'm sorry. So I won't uh, go any further on that one. But God is with us. And God is our strength. And God is our protector. If God will protect this city, the city of Jerusalem, who was, for the most part, faithful to him, do the same thing for us as believers? Of course, the answer is yes. God protects those that are his. Thirdly, the absolute sovereignty of God. The absolute sovereignty of God. We see this in verses 8 through 11. I'm just going to read the first two verses here at the beginning. And that is, come behold the works of the Lord. What desolation he hath made in the earth. He makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. 
he burneth the chariot in the fire. In verse 8, we're told to behold the works of the Lord. You tell me what you're beholding, what you are focusing your attention on, and I'll tell you what you're becoming. A warrior, a depressed, if you're focusing on the events of what's going on and you're allowing that to, to get into you and just that's all you can think about, that's all you can dwell on. Or if you keep your eyes on the Lord, keep your eyes in his word, allow him to use you, then you're going to be growing through this and relying on him and leaning on him. This verse tells us to behold the works of the Lord. The word desolation literally means who hath put desolate, uh, desolation, destroying our enemy. This announcement is very vague in general so that it would apply to almost any action or occasion when the people of God were delivered from a pressing situation. Are you keeping your eyes on the Lord? Where is your focus? Secondly, in verse 9, I see that as Almighty God, he makes war cease. What does it tell us in verse 9? Well, it tells us about the weaponry they had. A broken bow is of no value. A spear that is shattered is no longer effective. Chariot set on fire cannot function. These were the mighty weapons they used back then. But you know, even any weapon that we have today, God is greater than they are. And they can cease just by his word. Many people put their trust in a big military army, talking about the nation. And they think, man, look at our army, look at what we have, look at our weaponry. No one's going to be able to do anything to us. Well, if God wanted to, it could be going like that. Because God is greater than any military or any person that we have that we face. Hasn't it felt like there's nothing that we can do to stop this virus, COVID-19? I mean, we, some may feel helpless and hopeless. In, his, in, in uh, his position as sovereign king, God is in charge. And someone recently said, unfortunately, when I wrote my notes out, I did not write the person's name down. I, I apologize, but someone said this recently, and I thought it was very fitting. COVID-19 has ripped away the illusion that we ever had any control over the details of our lives. Isn't that so true? With all the crazy things going on, in this world today and personal trials that we may be facing, what can we do? What can we do? I mean, should we crawl under the desk in the fetal position and just cry and hope and pray and, and stay there hoping things change? Is that what God would want us to do? To allow depression and anxiety and worry and fear to control our lives to the fact that we would not be able to be used as effectively for the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what devil is wanting to do. That's why he's trying to get us to be like that. I believe the devil is also trying to use some of this stuff to be able to get, you know, if we're attacked from the outside, the church, what does that do? That pulls us together. That pulls us together to fight. But when we get attacked inside, just our members do it, that can separate that can cause more problems. We should be wearing masks. No, we shouldn't. This is a big hoax. No, it's not. I can't believe that the President Biden got in. Yes, it's great. Folks, Satan is having a heyday trying to tear apart the Christian church from within. And we need to not rely on and look at these circumstances going on around us and think, why, God, why are you doing this? We need to turn to God and say, God, we don't understand it, but we know you're in control. And we are going to lean on you and trust you. 
Thirdly, I see the answer to that question. What can we do? What can we do? We need to realize God reigns supremely. God reigns supremely. And that's in verse 10. We'll read both verse 10 and 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. We see here that it says, be still. Now, be still. I know, you know, parents, many of us were parents. And when your kids are in the pew with you and stuff, and you say, be still. Our interpretation was, don't talk, sit still, don't move around and act up. But that's not what this verse is saying. Be still does not mean motionless. The Hebrew word means to relax, let go, to cease. In other words, don't get all worked up. Be still, C cease, let go, relax. Today's lingo, chill out. Now, chill out, man. In the midst of all the chaos, whatever might come, be still. Many people today, as I've mentioned, are worrying, anxious, depressed, fearful, because they don't know what the future holds. Let's look, and this is going to be a longer passage that I'll be reading. And if you want to turn, you may, but Matthew 6. Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Let's see what Jesus says about this, about worrying and anxiety and depression. Verse 25 says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye, uh, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto your stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What can we do to change the situation by worrying, by fearing, by getting depressed and letting, letting those circumstances control our life? Get in pleasant, unpleasant news? Be still. Going through a tough time? Be still. We're told in Philippians 4, we are to be anxious for nothing. He says not only, though, that we're to be still. He also says, know that he is God. Know that he is God. Why does he say that here? Well, I think it's because we often forget how powerful and amazing God is. Look at the previous verses that we just read. The power that's shown, the faithfulness he is to us, being present with us through all circumstances. He is reminding us who is really in charge and who is really has the great power. 
God will ultimately be exalted throughout the world. I said I, I started making comment about that earlier, and you remember the verse that said, um, let's see if I got this right here. Yeah, be still know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Maybe some of the circumstances we're going through right now so God can be exalted and glorified. I don't know. I'm not God. But I do know that God is in control and he, and he will use this to meet his goals. You know, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the news that we get, no matter what happens in government, no matter what comes, what may, God is with us. He is our refuge. Have you taken your eyes off of God? Do you need to refocus your attention back on God? We don't know what the future holds. You know, I, I, I like the song that Miss Sego sang, talking about the anchor. What are you anchoring your life to right now? What is holding you in place? So you don't waver. But you say faithfully to the Lord. One thing that we can be sure of. God is in control. And God is our refuge. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to ask a couple questions before I pray. Mainly I was talking to Christians tonight. Because that's where God is there to help. That's where God is living within you. But there might be someone here, possibly, that has never trusted Christ as their personal Savior. You may not know for sure you're on your way to heaven, but the Bible tells us we can know. If you were to be heading down the road and a car came and smacked into you, and you went out into eternity... Do you know for sure you would open your eyes into heaven? Is there anyone here who would say, Pastor Rodney, I do not know for sure I'm on my way to heaven. Would you just pray for me? My prayer will not save you, but I pray that you have the courage to come forward and to talk to someone today. Is there anyone? I do not know for sure I'm saved. Will you just raise your hand? Okay, Christian. Where's your focus? What are you anchoring your life to today? You say, Pastor Rodney, I, I need to refocus. I need to turn my eyes back on, on Jesus, on God, instead of on my circumstances. Will you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? See that hand, that one. Anyone else? I'd encourage you here when we do the invitational song, if you raise your hand or even if you didn't, and you need to make things right with God, you need to re turn your focus back on him. I encourage you to come down to the altar here and just pray. Get along with God for a few minutes. You say, well, I can do that right here in my, my seat. Well, I know in my own life, the times that I did it in the seat compared to the times I came down front, the times I came down front meant a lot more. It stuck with me. So I encourage you to do that right at the first word of the song. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I know you gave me this message. I know you used it in my life. I pray that you'd use it in each of our lives. Father, that we would keep our eyes and our focus on you and not the circumstances and, and get all worked up and worried and, and defeated so that we can't be used by you. So I pray that you'd be with each one of us, Father, that we would make the decisions we need to. And I'll give you the honor, glory, and praise for everything that's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Beeson. Let's all stand to our feet. You are my fortress. Listen to the words while you sing them. If there's a need, you come as we sing. You are my fortress. You are my hiding place. In time of trouble, I run to the rock and seek your face.
Let's sing the second. You are my fortress. You are my Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Pastor Beeson, for the very timely message. Um, God is our refuge. He is our hiding place. I hope that goes with you this week as you go about your business and uh, interact with people that you may know. Uh, be a witness this week. Invite folks to come to church with you. Um, attempt to uh, allow, of course, the Holy Spirit to use you in a mighty way as we uh, move and and society, and at the workplace, in the classroom, wherever it may be. All right, pray for one another. Pray for Leslie tomorrow as she undergoes this surgery. And um, right now, I don't know of anybody else that's in the hospital or is having a procedure. I don't know of anybody who has COVID right now. Um, if you would like to raise your hand, I'll pray for you. <laughs> you better not be here, all right? Um, continue to pray for Miss Elaine, of course, as well. No change with her, right, Pastor Warren? Her hearing loss and things. She's uh, she's a real trooper. All right. Um, Jared and Taylor Cox, is this the first time you've been here with the baby or not? You've been here before, right? But have you gotten to introduce him? Okay. All right. Why don't you tell us again here? Okay. Joseph Lee Cox. All right. November the 4th, maybe some of them haven't gotten to see him. I was getting a little bit of that here tonight, wanting to uh, you to introduce him. All right. So, all right. Grace, do you have something you want to say? What's that? All right. Got a friend telling on a friend. Um, no, pray for Briley Mikesell. Okay, I guess. Pray for Briley Mikesell. She uh, might have some symptoms. All right. Well, let's be dismissed in a word of prayer, okay? Jared, since you're here, thanks for being here. It's, I know that you guys are trying to keep the babies all healthy and everything and stuff, but it's good to see you guys here. Why don't you close us in a word of prayer? And uh, don't forget about the books, folks. Um, we plan on those not being here next week. Okay, now that's the plan. Whether or not they will be taken or not, I don't know. But you may only have tonight and the rest of this week to get to look through them, okay? And so uh, look through those books. This may be your last chance. All right, Jared? Thank you for coming. Have a blessed week. Look forward to seeing you on Wednesday night.